Thank you for joining me. Big pleasure. Well, I wanted to talk to you because you have a really terrific career. You've worked with uh, the late and incredibly revered director, George Romero, on a number of projects. Yeah, three. Like three, Survival of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Land of the Dead. Yeah, and actually, come to think of it, I also edited, um, he did a, a, with the writer of um, Survival, it was Max Brooks, and one other, they did a, an interview with a bunch of students that they turned into an actual film. So that was actually the fourth thing that I did that uh, less well known. You've also done lots and lots and lots of television and big TV shows like Hannibal, Winona Earp, Ransom, The Listener, just to yeah. name a few. When I got started, I was only doing feature length. Um, I started off back in 1995 um, working with a guy in Montreal uh, who did his first feature as a producer. And uh, I did the first four films that he produced with his company. This was all non-union. What I'd done way back, I worked on Rocky IV as a trainee AD when I came out of film school, knowing that editors were Directors Guild, but I was in Vancouver where editors are IA. So I got into the union, then on honorary withdrawal for 14 years. I ended up moving to Toronto uh, when I heard that a friend of my brother's was shooting his first feature and I knew that if I worked at this company that had offered me a job that had an avid, I could say to the guy, I'll cut your film for free. So I did four of his movies that were all um, non-union in Quebec. But when I did get a job offer in Toronto because of the work I had done there, a union show, I just simply went to the guild and said, can I upgrade now to editor? after being on our withdrawal for 14 years. Wow. And they said, sure. So my, my DGC number is only 499. So I think it was easier in the day to be able to upgrade from a guy who was a trainee AD to editor because they looked at the resume and it actually had, you know, some decent films on it. So uh, that's what I did. And over the course of the next, let me see, I guess it might've been 14 years. I only did feature length. Uh, so if you made from uh, TV films, plus the Romero films, and the first TV show I did, I think was with you guys at Unnatural History, with Richard Anobile, who'd been trying to get me to work with him. Mm -hmm. And I accepted in part because we knew we were working with Mike Werb, who had written The Mask and Face Off and thought might be a cool guy to work with. And so I took that job and that sort of launched me more into the television side of things. I'd done a few features after, worked with Vincenzo Natale on Haunter. Uh, I did Phantom Punch, I, that might've been before. Um, but in any event, the TV business, uh, there's more of it in Toronto in the long run for all of us editors than getting individual feature projects. I've been super lucky I guess you call it lucky. Uh, I don't have an agent, never had an agent because I've been around in Toronto long enough. And I guess the resume shows a number of projects that are rather well known that you get to know who the post-production supervisors are and they get to trust you. And so that's where I get my calls for the most part. And they put your name forward. Yeah. So Richard put my name forward for this show that's going on the Oprah network. So that's the one that he called me for recently. And so I worked with him on a number of different shows. Um, October Faction that I did between two seasons of uh, Winona was with Richard. Mm -hmm. Then worked Paul Ackerley uh, on Winona Earp for four separate seasons. So you just get to know the people who are working in the business. They get to know who you are. Sometimes it's a producer that calls me, Nicholas Tabarak who I originally hired to be the uh, the uh, production manager on a film I produced called Reluctant Angel oh, back in 1997, has repaid that favor multiple times by getting me on board on films that he was production managing and offered to bring me in. So I work with Alan Moyle on Weird's film, which was a really fun film to do. So yeah, you get to know the people in the business and they get to trust what you're doing. And now I'm ready to retire. <laughs> uh, are you really ready to retire? No, no. <laughs> did you go to school for film? I did, although not initially. Initially, I went to school uh, and got a Bachelor of Commerce degree. In Quebec, 
out of high school, there's a two-year college program called SEJA that you go through, and then you do the university program. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my dad, being um, rather a practical man, just said, look, go to school, uh, get a degree, whatever it is, at least have a degree until you can figure out what it is you want to do. So I picked this uh, commerce degree, um, but I was lucky because at the time in Montreal, the commerce degree was also uh, allowed you to take a lot of electives and it had a more of an arts approach to it. So when I did the, I did statistics and accounting and uh, finance, I also did astronomy, theology, psychology, film, music, and uh, they were all great courses. So when I graduated, I took a year off to travel around. I followed a girlfriend on a holiday out to Vancouver. We broke up after a couple of months and I said, I'm going to stay. And then I made a list of six things in my life that I liked. And I picked one of those six that I thought I would have as much fun learning as making money at. And I had loved the film class that I took when I was doing my commerce degree. It was more of a film history course, but there were certain movies along the way that had really impressed me. Um, and it's what inspired me to take that film class, the history class. I loved Fellini's Amarcord, and I loved uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's Sabrisky Point. And there's flaws in those films, but what worked for me for both of them was music. I loved how the music in each of those films became a character. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. So I applied to Simon Fraser uh, to see if I could get into their film program. It took a long time from the application. So uh, one of the things that I did, I traveled through the United States with a friend of mine in a car for about three weeks. And when I ended up in San Francisco, I decided that in order to improve my chances with my entrance into the film school, I was going to write a script. And I wanted to write the script based on this book by Robert Silverberg called Up the Line ended up getting an appendix attack and had to go to the hospital for five days. So while I was recovering for those five days in the hospital, I wrote my script. Ah. And then when I went to my interview, um, I had the script in my hand. No one was going to read it. But what it showed was that I had uh, a desire to do this. And I'm also, I shoot a lot of photography, a lot of photographs. Mm -hmm. And so I brought a bunch of them with me and I laid them on the table and I said, I want to make these pictures move. And I got in. That's and perfect. so over the course of five years, I did another four year degree mm -hmm. uh, in film and electronic music. And so when I graduated uh, way back, uh, 86, the school offered me um, a job in their equipment room so that I'd be the guy handing the gear out to the student filmmakers, mm. also managing the budgets for their projects. Mm. But I took the job in part because it gave me some money, but it also gave me access to all the equipment. Ah. ah. And so some of the dance choreographers at the school saw me there. They hired me to shoot their dance performances, mm. and which I did. And then as I got more into it, I started bringing more than one camera and I would always edit the stuff. That led to a years long uh, collaboration with a Montreal choreographer called uh, Jean-Pierre Perrault, who would fly me to Montreal to set up multi-camera shoes for his dance performances. And I would edit everything that I did. So because I'd been doing this stuff in the film program, a guy named Neil Boyd, who's a criminologist, called me up and asked if I was interested in doing a a documentary about capital punishment based on his book called The Last Dance. And he and I share an abhorrence for capital punishment. Uh, and so we collaborated on this uh, documentary. And that led to another documentary that I did with him on the legalization of marijuana and prostitution. And that's how it evolved from commerce to Simon Fraser to doing dance videos to educational documentaries to putting myself in the position of being available for somebody who is doing their first feature. It sounds like you just grabbed every opportunity and said yes. So there's, there is a certain amount of luck along the way. When I got the call from George Romero, I got the call actually from the post-production supervisor. Mm -hmm. George had been doing all of his movies in Pittsburgh um, and realized it was going to be too expensive 
to do Land of the Dead. He want, This is a bigger budget movie for him, $20 million, funded by Universal. In order to make the $20 million go further, mm-hmm. go as far as he wanted it to go, he was not going to be able to do it in Pittsburgh or L.A. So he had done his movie Bruiser in Toronto. So he thought, we'll go to Toronto and we'll do it. He wanted to bring his editor from L.A., but the editor, L.A. base, wanted more money than, than the production could afford. So he was looking for a local guy. And this is where luck sort of plays a role. Uh, George went in and he saw the demo that I had done. I just showed a dialogue scene with two people at a table. And George was impressed with the fact that he saw the edit choices, because George himself comes from an editing style background. And he understood the editing choices that were made. So he brought me in. And um, I was sitting in the room just waiting by myself. Uh, and then in walks this six foot five guy with three or four other people. And he walks in the room and he looked at me and he said, so have you finished editing my film? <laughs> and I said, in my head, it's done. I think what he was looking for mm-hmm. not was whether I could edit. It's whether he could spend five months in a room with me. Mm. In the end, a lot of it comes down to that. It comes down to the relationship that you have with the creator you're working with. And you're able to bounce back ideas. And then you come to learn to respect the decisions that each person is making. It's harder to do that if you're not getting along with them. But in the end, he knew right away that I was the guy. Mm -hmm. And it was inspired by that answer. And you guys had a a really strong friendship outside of Correct. Yeah. So, you know, during the course of making the film, uh, George was in a good enough position that uh, we had our 10 weeks to deliver his director's cut, no interference from anybody. His producing partner, Peter Grunwald, who would help put the deal together, uh, was with us as well. And we went to Universal and showed it to them. And I went with George and um, it was a really, it was was an eye opening in the sense they didn't have high expectations for it. This is a zombie movie. They had been successful with um, Zack Snyder's Dawn remake. They thought, okay, well, let's, you know, we'll, we'll see what we, we have here. And the, the head of production turned around after the screening, looked at both of us and said, that was way better than I thought it was going to be. But hanging with him in Los Angeles which was really good because then it's like us going in and us against them in a way. Mm-hmm. It was interesting because after that experience, he and his wife separated. So when Universal... Uh, told George that he had to go to London, Paris, and Edinburgh to to promote Land of the Dead, Mm -hmm. uh, he could bring his partner. And while he was splitting from his wife, so he said, I want to bring my editor, Michael. And so George and I were together, traveling in London, staying at these high-end hotels, the Dorchester in London, going out for dinners, being taken out. And we just really developed a friendship. And so when he passed away, it was very, very sad for me. It's funny, I was supposed to go to a film festival um, in uh, Slovenia. And that's when he got diagnosed with lung cancer just before we were supposed to go. So I flew off. I saw him just before I left. I flew off to go on my original planned trip through, I was in Tel Aviv and various places. I was making my way up to meet with him in Slovenia. So he was not able to go. And on my last night in Zagreb, I got the call saying he'd passed away. Oh. Um, I had expected, he had been told he had up to a year to live with his, in the end it was maybe six more weeks from when he received that news. It happened so fast. Um, and it hit me hard, you know, it was, you don't realize sometimes what you've developed with people until you don't have them anymore. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like losing a father. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah, so I'm still very good friends with his wife. So we see each other regularly. Um, She works with the, or is head of the George uh, A. Romero Foundation in Pittsburgh. What's the foundation do? So it is in support of up and coming filmmakers in the horror genre. Wow. But he and John Russo um, uh, and the lead actor, Russ Striner, the three of those guys came up with the seminal zombie movie that accidentally became a political statement. So you had, think it wasn't on purpose? They hired a black actor who was a friend of theirs to be the lead because he was the best actor. Mm-hmm. 
And it was in the course of finishing the film when Martin Luther King died. And they realized that they had made a political statement because the guy that killed him just randomly shot the guy because of his color. Mm. And um, it was that the eureka moment for George when he said, okay, every other film I'm going to make moving forward will have a political theme. Um, Diary of the Dead was the most um, creative project in a way because it started off as something different from what it became. He started it off, these kids were in a forest making uh, a zombie movie on the night that the zombie apocalypse started. And the kid keeps his camera rolling over the course of the film to shoot what's happening to him and his friends as they try to get back home. Um, the original intent was to play as a series of eight minute long takes, let everything play out wow. as he's recording. Well, in the edits, we, we quickly realized that you can't, you can't always make that work. The actors, A, can't hold the scene, or B, uh, the scene itself lags because the writing wasn't strong enough to hold an eight or seven minute take. So we had to figure out a way to make it work. And we came up with the concept afterwards that one of the characters decides to make a political statement by editing the footage that she had at the end of all this, while she was stuck in her quarantine on her computer, she decided to upload this to a YouTube mm -hmm. and then added a voice over to it to make comments about things that were happening about media and media presentation about truth, non-truth. And what was interesting is we one day went to George's apartment. There was about six of us, George, uh, Peter, the producer, myself, uh, a couple of others. And we put a bottle of gin in the middle of the table and we helped ourselves to gin over a course of three hours while we just riffed on politics oh. and propaganda and media and recorded ourselves. Brought all that stuff into the edit suite and used it as sort of radio broadcasts or things that people were listening to to help make the political point that this filmmaker was trying to make. And what was interesting is that afterwards, I'm not Actra, we hired Loop Group actors to recreate what we'd done after we'd selected what we did. They couldn't do it. They couldn't make it sound as honest and real. So we used our voices. And the union was okay with it. Wow. <laughs> but that's an example of how a movie can change. You know, all, movies always change. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you've got a number of factors involved. You've got the original script. Then you've got actors who are hired. So the actors bring whatever they represent to the character. And then the actors have to read the lines in a particular given way. And the director shoots it in multiple different takes with different line readings from different angles. Then the editor takes it and rewrites it by jumbling up the performances, cutting it from different angles, and then almost always shortening the film mm -hmm. to make it what it ends up being. And the editor does that in collaboration with the director, with the producer, or sometimes distributor. Our job is to direct the audience's experience of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the part I fell in love with doing. That's incredible. Yeah. Dari is the exact example yeah. of starting somewhere but ending somewhere totally different mm -hmm. less so on television yeah. you know te television has a uh it has a look it has a feel uh it has a story points it has to get to in the course of its 43 46 48 minutes whatever whether you're network or net, uh, netflix you know network year 43 when i did hannibal yes we had deliver not just 43 we had to deliver each act out on the zero frame and the commercial had to start on the five. Oh. No such issues with Netflix. And no one cares if it's 36 minutes because you are you just hit skip next show. It's very freeing not having a, a, like the, the total runtime anymore. 100% agree. I know that you love music. I see a keyboard. What's your process for putting music in a cut? So you know what? It depends. Um, sometimes it's the scene that determines uh, what music gets used. Mm -hmm. You know, I will have a library of music of different uh, moods. 
And a lot of cases where a song is appropriate, and there are many times when you would edit to a song. So when we did Hannibal, mm -hmm. Brian Reitzel provided us ahead of time with a lot of classical cues. So when we did our food montages, we would cut them to the piece of music. I asked for this. During the mix, sometimes Reitzel would say, that's not really the cue I would use. I'd use a different cue and would throw off the edits. Oh. So I asked to always get to review the montages after the mix so that I could change them. I would never change the length, mm -hmm. but I might change where the cut point was or where the emphasis was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they allowed me that reluctantly. But it's not fair to editors. And the producers have all watched it and watched the music you've got in there and everything's going and then it goes to the mix stage and somebody comes along and says, eh, you know what, that song's not right. Let's try a different song. Without ever thinking about the work you put into making the pictures work, you want to know what it is you're cutting to generally um, and not have it changed on you. I know with Weirdsville, what was great about Weirdsville is going in, I knew that Alan Moyle loved to edit his films to songs. Okay. His films don't have a lot of score. They're filled with songs and the songs create the mood. That film also started out as something different. It was written as a broad comedy and we got Scott Speedman to be in it. And one of Scott's stipulations was that if he was gonna do the film about uh, a recovered heroin addict, he was gonna play it straight. He was not gonna play his character broadly. So that affected a lot of the music choices. It affected how some of the scenes worked. We still had broad comedy, but it allowed us to do something I thought way more interesting with this than just an over the top uh, goofball 70s guys running around being chased by people looking for money. Mm -hmm. It became more introspective. And I was able to apply some of that introspection to certain scenes. Mm -hmm. The music allowed us to get inside his head. And then we'd end up going through these crazy laugh out loud moments. And so the reviews for the film were mixed. Some people absolutely got what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Loved the tonal shifts, loved what was going on. Others thought, how can you make a comedy about heroin addiction? Mm -hmm. For me, I loved the fact that it was both. And so I always do the temp scores myself for all the shows that I edit, mm -hmm. partly because I know my the music library that I have. And I, I like figuring out what mood I'm cutting to rather than cutting the scene and sending it away and then having it back with the piece of music I don't really know. Sometimes you do that. If you get overwhelmed, you know, the assistant can, can work on music, obviously can be great at it. But I find most of the time I'll cut the scene first. Mm -hmm. Sometimes after I've cut the scene and before I put any music in, um, I just watch the scene totally silent. I just mm -hmm. see how the scene's going without the dialogue, just watching how it's pacing, looking at how, what story's being told just between the eyes and the reaction shots between characters. And then I'll add music. And I rarely get to the end of a project and then go back and do all the music. You know, we obviously work with dailies and uh, if I finish cutting my dailies for the day, well, I then switch to music. Mm -hmm. I'll just apply music right away and then start building the sound design, sound effects. That's interesting. Yeah. But watching it silent is actually a pretty cool thing to do. What are you looking for when you're watching it silent? Just to see if uh, cuts feel right or not. Okay. Uh, sometimes you don't get an exact uh, answer for that because the dialogue in many cases, you're held on a character because the dialogue is important to say. But for me, sometimes it's just the rhythm of how a scene is playing, and even scenes with less dialogue, mm -hmm. just to watch the rhythm of how they go. I did the, um, with uh, George Romero, I did the director's uh, commentary. And one of the things that I stated about Land of the Dead, uh -huh. there was a scene where there were zombies in town and these vehicles were coming in and driving past them and they were driving around swinging like this and then all driving out of town and there was just this big uh, choreographed in a way uh, series of shots that George had done so what I explained I watched it at one point silent because I had my start cutting dance videos mm -hmm. I approached it as if it was a dance um... so I wanted to see if the cuts played like a dance 
That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so you looked at it from a different perspective. Yeah, just to see, you know, what it looked like visually. And so going back to your question about music and um, the films that I liked, Amarcord and um, Zabriskie Point Pointing, or even Straw Dogs, the end of Straw Dogs with the bagpipes playing. Um, to me, it added such an incredible dimension. And so I look at individual moments in films sometimes. Amarcord's a perfect example. There's a sequence where these young boys in the town set in 1940s in Rimini, these boys go to the closed down hotel for the winter and they all have in their head, they've imagined what goes on in this hotel when all the stars are there in the summer, but it's windy day, it's fall and they go and they peek in and it's the empty stairwell and then Nina Rota's music starts to play and each boy goes into their head in an imaginary dance with a partner on the steps of this hotel mm -hmm. and I love that. It had nothing to do with the story. Some people who've watched Amarcord said, well, we like movies with a bit more story. But for me, it didn't matter because it's individual moments. Mm -hmm. And the, the strength of the film is that there's like 30 miniature movies in it. One of them being these boys imagining dancing with a partner on the steps of the closed down hotel. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's the music that brings you there. Just sucks me right in. Yeah. And so when I talk about being, you know, some of the soundtracks, I collected, I have 3,000 soundtracks. <laughs> and, I believe it. And I listen to soundtracks a lot, not just as source music for any project that might do. You're creating a mood. And part of what films are supposed to do is to put you into a place and into a story and into a world you never have been in yourself in many ways, right? That's the imagination of the movies. Mm -hmm. And music really helps with that. And so I've always been attracted to how the two of them combine. Mm, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> Thanks so much.